Danielle Strickland is a writer and a speaker and a justice advocate. Uh, she's worked for years to stop uh, sex trafficking around the world. Um, uh, she spoke a year ago at the Global Leadership Summit where uh, Jory and I tried to go every summer in Chicago and Regina used to sing there at Willow Creek Church. And uh, uh, one of the stories she uh, tells is uh, she was uh, scheduled to speak at a conference and her connecting flight was late and she had to wait four hours for the next flight so she had to call and tell them she would not ma make her speaking engagement. They said, okay, we'll put you on tomorrow. Uh, morning. And uh, so then she got on her flight and she introduced herself to the man uh, with whom she was seated and, and he asked her what she did and she said, well, I, you know, I try to stop uh, drug or sex trafficking uh, around the world. I'm an author, I'm a speaker, I'm a Christian. And he says, oh my goodness, last flight I was on, I was seated next to a pastor and now you and she looked at him. She says, uh, how long have you been running from God? And he looked at her with, with shock on his face. He says, how did you know? She said, well, if God seated you next to a pastor on one flight and then me on the next, pretty good chance he's trying to get your attention. And they talked. And before the flight was over, she prayed with him and he gave his life to Christ. After they landed... In baggage claim, he came up to her and he says, thank you, you saved my life. She says, not really, God did. He says, no, I'm serious. Tonight was the night I was going to take my life. Danielle missed her flight and it messed up her plans. But she let God use her with other plans he had for her that night. And God wants to use you and me in the same ways. God has called us who have given our life to Christ to be on mission with Jesus wherever we go during the week. Don't think that the only opportunity that you have to serve God is here on Sunday mornings in the worship team or in the tech booth or ushering or back in the kitchen or teaching the kids or the youth. God has many opportunities for you to serve him through the week. We need to shift from more programs to more mission fields. More programs in the church are not going to saturate Portland with the fullness of Christ. Every one of you has a unique calling from God to minister to the people he has put in your life. Where you work is a mission field. Where you go to school is a mission field. The athletic team you're on is a mission field. The club you belong to is a mission field. Your family is your mission field. The church is made to go more. Church is not just what happens in the church building. We are the church. We're the church wherever we go. Read this with me. I've said this every week. In this series, we are called to be disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who take the fullness of Christ to every corner of the world. We're called to go. Thinking that only pastors are called to go has choked, put a chokehold on the church. Home Depot's motto, I've read it every week in this series, you can do it, we can help. They say, you've got a project, we can help you get the right stuff, we can help even, even help you think it through. That's the role of the leaders in the church, to help you understand that you can pastor people far from God in your life. You can be a minister for Christ in your family. You can be a pastor to people who don't know Christ where you work. You can be a, a pastor to people at your school. You can reach people on your athletic team that don't know squat about Jesus. You were made for more. Our church is made for more. The Apostle Paul writes one of his best-known verses. Read this with me. 
now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. God can do more through us. How can the church do more? How can the church go more? I find three ways in our text today that the Apostle Paul tells us that we can go more. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 in your Bible. If you want to use the ones under our seats, it's on page 1,176. First, follow Jesus. In Ephesians 5 verse 1, Paul writes, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. What's God's example? And walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. God's example is that he sent Christ into the world. Jesus came to us. We can't expect people to come to, into the church, so we take the church to them. We follow Jesus' example and go to people. We don't expect them to come to us. A newly married couple living in Austin, Texas, was living in an apartment complex, and they read that 95% of people that live in apartments do not go to church. And so they invited as many people as they knew in their apartment to come over for dinner. And they had a great time getting to know each other and laughing. And at the end of the evening, they said, you know, we'd like to do this every week if you'd like. Next week, we'd like to explore the Bible. If any of you would like to come and explore it with us, we'd like you to come. And then they did it every other week. Then the other week, they would have everybody for dinner. Rosario Champagne Butterfield wrote The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. At 28, she boldly declared herself a lesbian. She finished her Ph.D. in English and Cultural Studies. She was a teaching associate at one of the strongest women studies programs in the nation. She was recruited by universities all across the country to serve in faculty roles advancing radical leftist ideologies. At 36, she was one of the few tenured women at a large research university, Syracuse University. She became a tenured radical. By all standards, she had it made. That same year, Christ claimed her for himself. It started when a nearby pastor responded to one of her blogs online. And they began kind of an email a relationship back and forth. He began to ask yourself, you know, how did you arrive at your conclusions? How do you know that you're right? They went back and forth, and then he invited her over for dinner. Well, she was a well-known and loved uh, person in the Syracuse University community and quite confident, but going to a pastor's house for dinner was way out of her element. She didn't know what to expect. She said if they would have invited her to church that night, she would have careened like a skateboard off a cliff and never come back. But they didn't do that. They just talked with her. They were kind. They respected her uh, viewpoints. And they were intelligent. They were well-educated people, too. And uh, they didn't expect her to come to church. They brought the church to, their, to her. And uh, one day, she committed her life to Christ. As Rosario began to sprinkle her new ways of thinking, her faith into her classroom lectures and speeches around the country, eyebrows raised. Their radical feminist studies trailblazer was asking new questions. Eventually, she left her lesbian lifestyle behind, and she left her teaching post. She married a loving Christian husband, and they're raising kids, and she's writing and speaking around the country. The pastor and his wife followed Jesus by going to Rosaria. Second, be changed by Jesus. In verse 3, Paul says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity 
or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Our culture is so inundated with sexuality. We're supposed to be pure, and when we are, we're different. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Paul says, no vulgar language, no coarse jokes. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. When we are changed by Jesus, we shine like stars in a dark night. A recent study found that people that go to church regularly, on average, live 7.7 years longer than other people. I mean, that's a reason to invite people to church. I mean, we're all trying to live healthier and so we can live longer. Apparently, when we are changed by Jesus, we live healthier and longer. Verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. When we're changed by Jesus, we are changed into people with joy. We just finished a series this last summer called Fixer Upper, where we talk about fixing up our minds to think differently so that we live with more happiness and joy. My wife, Jory, is a naturally happy person. Uh, when she doesn't know it, uh, I, I hear her kind of buzzing around the house, humming. And a lot of our kids have picked up this habit, too. With a large family, nine children like we have, we had to assign jobs just to make the house work. I mean, otherwise it would be a wreck in no time. And... Uh, and so, like, for example, right now, Cam mows the lawn with our ride-on lawnmower. Uh, Jamie mows the lawn with the push lawnmower, the spots that Jamie, uh, Cam can't get to. Uh, Jamie just uh, finished uh, power washing the fence. Uh, Cam kind of takes care of bark dust, raking it, keeping branches out. And they both do the, you know, share the dishes. And Erica, her job is to do the counters and uh, sweep the floors and swiffer the floors. Well, anyway, uh, at one point... Um, our son David, a second son, had the duty of cleaning the bathrooms. I think all of our kids have had that duty at some point, except Erica. It's time when we get her in there, huh? And um, so um, I heard David one day cleaning a toilet, and he was singing at the top of his lungs, Be exalted, oh God, above the head. He was just going at it. I mean, I tell you, that had to come from Jory. And Jesus, because there's nothing to sing about in our toilets. <laughs> Third, be on mission with Jesus. Verse 14, this is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul says, wake up. Don't sleepwalk through your day. I've told you before that two years during college, I worked uh, during the summers at a Denny's restaurant as a cook. Uh, and this is in Santa Rosa, California, and uh, I would get done at 2 a.m., and I'd be so tired, I'd be feeling like I was going to fall asleep as I made the drive home. And so I'd roll the windows all the way down, turn the radio up as high as it could go, and uh, just to stay awake. Paul says, don't sleepwalk through your day. Now Solomon, in the Song of Songs, tells married couples not to sleepwalk through their marriage. Uh, uh, Song of Songs, chapter 5, this is every husband's favorite passage in the Bible. I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, this is the wife sleeping, but she's dreaming. My beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. Uh, Her husband's knocking. He's in love with her. He wants to spend time with her. He wants to make love to her. I have taken off my robe. She's responding in her dream. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? She says, I just had a bath. I don't want to get my feet dirty. My beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. 
I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands drip with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my cloak, those watchmen of the walls. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my beloved, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. A lot of people, when they read this, they say, you know, I, I missed that in Sunday school when I was growing up. This is a book about uh, love and sex and marriage and romance. And the author's making the point that if your mate initiates romantically, do everything you can uh, if you're physically able to respond and don't be an idiot. Just like we're not to sleepwalk through our marriage, Paul says we're not to sleepwalk through our lives, be on mission with Jesus. So we wake up and notice our opportunities. Verse 15, read this with me. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is is. We're all full-time ministers for Christ. Everywhere we go, we all have people in our lives. God has called us to pastor that are far from God. We're all missionaries for Christ. It doesn't have to mean you have to go across oceans or go into jungles or take a spear in your body. You can walk across the street. You can walk across the cubicle. So how do we organize people to take the fullness of Christ to every corner of Portland. We don't have to. God has already organized His people. There are people in your family who don't know God. There are people at your work who don't know Christ. There are people at your school who are far from God. There are people in your neighborhood who don't know anything about Christ. Paul just wants us to wake up and notice the people He's put in our lives and look for ways to love them and reach out to them. Danielle Strickland also tells the story of her son. Uh, He was eight years old and he was uh, wanting to bring Valentine's Valentine's Day. With the Valentine cards he'd gotten for all the kids in his class, he wanted to put a tract about Jesus. And she was thinking, "Ah, that doesn't sound like a good idea. They, They were new in the neighborhood. They were new to the school. She didn't want to make waves. But he says, can you think of a better way of expressing love than Jesus? She said, well, no. A week later, they had teacher conferences, and she came in for his conference, and the teacher was there. The principal was there. The vice principal was there. She said, I knew he was bright, but I didn't know he was this bright. And uh, they sat down, and the vice principal pulled out the tract, and he said, did you do this? She said, no, I did everything I could to talk him down. Well, good. We just wanted to make sure. A couple weeks ago, I told you about Andy, head of HR at a large national theater chain, and he was given the task of uh, finding a way to meaningfully employ people with disabilities. He really didn't want to work on that progress. He kept pushing it off. And and one day in his discipleship group at church with three other guys, uh, they came across uh, uh, Proverbs 31.8, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. And he thought, it just kind of hit him. These are my people. And so they began to change uh, the way... uh, They screened people, and within 90 days, they made their first hire. They hired a boy named Kyle with autism. A week later, he got a call from the general manager. He said, I got to talk to you about Kyle. He thought, oh, no, we must have missed something in the interview process. He says, Kyle came to work, and he's wearing his dad's watch, and he's so proud of it. He's holding his arm up, and and, uh, he's just kind of running around, uh, taking tickets, showing people to where their show is and cleaning up. He's great. Three weeks later, he got a call from the same general manager. He says, I got to talk to you about Kyle. 
And Andy thought, oh, dear, the honeymoon's over. He said, Kyle got a new watch. This one he bought himself with the money he made from his job, and he's so proud of it. And he's just all over the place being so helpful at the theater. Andy was so successful that he began to get calls from companies like Amazon and Google and Starbucks, even the White House. And eventually he started his own company. And as of today, they've employed 20,000 people with disabilities across the country. It's impacted his family, too. Watch Andy in his own words. Well, we said back in, you know, every parenting book out there says, be careful, they're watching. Yeah. That's true. Um, yeah. So six years ago, um, when we were involved with this whole process, um, my son was in second grade and get a phone call from his teacher. We need to talk about Gabe. And when you get a second grade teacher calling you personally, it is not usually a good thing. It's like, oh, boy, what do you do? And I love my son, but, you know, he's a boy. Um, sure. But um, she says, yeah, we need to talk about recess. And I'm like, now we're really, the, the odds of anything good coming out of this are small. Um, and so I, I said, okay, what's going on? She said, well, it's going on for about the past week. And I kind of got the, you know, oh, you've, something's going on and I, it's for a week. Yeah. And you haven't called me yet? Um, she said, yeah, so there's a boy who happens to have Down syndrome um, in, his, in his grade. And during lunch, they have what they call walk and talk. So part of it's eating your lunch, and another part is being outside, and walking a track, um, socializing and such. Um, apparently, Gabe went up to his, his um, fellow student named Eli and just started talking to him. Eli is one with Down syndrome, and um, Gabe is always in the thick of the social world, and he was an athlete and was on the football team and such, and so um, he just starts talking to Eli, and she said, but the ironic thing was is Gabe started talking to him on one day, and then Gabe asked a couple of their friends, of his friends, to come over and start talking to Eli later on in the week. Today's Friday, and I just watched half of the entire second grade football team walking with Eli and Eli being a part of it. And he is now, he's the big deal and it's genuine. And she goes, I just want to say thanks. And I'm like, I was speechless. I'm like, no, thank you. So Gabe gets home and we're talking and I said, Hey buddy, anything happened at school today? Nope. Anything happened on the playground today? Nope, everything's good. You know, the whole, it's fine, it's good. Right. And I finally had to fess up, and I told him what happened. What, you know, and I said, so what, what, what was in you that you'd say, hey, I'm going to go talk to Eli? And he looked at me, and he goes, Dad, that's what we do. We speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Oh, my gosh. When you're on mission for Jesus, your kids see it. They see when you care for people and reach out. The chances are pretty good. They'll do the same. The church is made to go more. We need to shift from more programs to more mission fields. More programs in church are not going to saturate every corner in Portland with the fullness of Christ. Only as we pastor people far from God in our lives can we do that. Anyone, every one of us has a mission field at our work, at our school, on our bus, on our, in our neighborhood, with our family. We may serve Christ in some way in the church. But we all have a mission field with people who don't know Christ that we can serve all through the week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul's keen insight that we were made for more and we were made to go more. We don't expect people to come into our church. Maybe some will, but that's pretty scary. But he calls us to go to them. 
and go into their world and love them where they are. And if we get a chance, talk about the difference Jesus has made in our lives. If God's uh, spoken to you today and you say, hey, I want to be on mission for you, would you tell him that right now? I want to give you a little time to pray. You tell him, you know, I want to be more alert this week, not sleepwalk through my week, but see who it is you've put in my life that you called me to minister to. And I want to be open to let you use me like you used Danielle on that flight. If you've never given your life to Christ, this would be a great chance. You say, I I know enough to know that you are the Son of God and you died for my sins on the cross. Would you come in and forgive my sins? Come and be part of my life. I want you all to pray right now. Lord, we, we've heard from you today, and we see that we are all ministers for you all through the week. So help us be alert this week to the opportunities you give us. In Jesus' name, amen.